The Earth is a changing planet. Due to continental drift, the configuration of the planet's surface changes slowly but continuously. New continents are formed, old continents fall apart. Mountain ranges emerge and are eroded again. As the position of the continents changes, so do the ocean and atmosphere currents that determine the distribution of heat across the planet. Thus, as a result of continental drift, the Earth's climate changes as well. Things we now take for granted were not true in the past. For instance, we know that the poles are covered with ice and that the North Pole is the realm of the polar bears, whereas penguins are perfectly adapted to the perpetual winter of Antarctica. This was not always the case. Having ice on the poles is in fact an exceptional situation if we consider the history of our planet as a whole. Continental drift works at a timescale of millions of years. It is not the only driver behind climatic changes. At a scale of 10 to hundreds of thousands of years, astronomic forcing is more important. Shifts in the position of the Earth in our solar system result in different distribution of the Earth, Sun's energy on our planet. These shifts are cyclic and for instance recognizable in the different glacial cycles of the last two million years. We will not consider those here, nor will we talk about the influence of greenhouse gases. In 2001, Sachos and co-authors published a review of the Earth climate over the last 65 million years. They produced a temperature curve that overall showed a cooling of the Earth's climate during the Cenozoic. This is not a gradual cooling, as the curve showed marked drops in temperature as well as some periods of warming. Big climatic events can be related to plate tectonics. But first, let's see how the temperature curve was constructed. Of course, we cannot measure the temperature of millions of years ago directly. Instead, we use signals that are preserved in the geological or fossil record and that are directly related to climatic conditions. These are called proxies. Examples of proxies are fossil pollen records, tree rings and ice cores. The Sachos curve was created using a very powerful and widely accepted proxy, the oxygen isotope contents of Formanifera one-celled organisms that can be found on the ocean floor. These foraminifera produce endoskeletons that fossilize well. The carbonate of these endoskeletons contains oxygen, which was extracted from the ocean water during life. Thus, these little fossils preserve an imprint of the isotope composition of the water millions of years ago. Paleoclimate analysis is based on the ratio of two of the stable isotopes of oxygen, O16 and O18. Oxygen 18 is heavier than O16 and as a consequence water molecules containing the O18 isotope are also a bit heavier than water with O16. This means that water with O16s evaporates more readily. It is found in somewhat heightened concentration in precipitation, fresh water and glacier ice. Therefore, during cold periods in which we have ice growth, O16 is extracted from the oceans, leading to a small increase in the concentration of O18 in the ocean water. So, back to the Sachos curve. Do you remember the overall trend of the Earth climate during the Cenozoic? The Earth climate went from warm to cold, even with formation of land ice in both polar regions. So our first step should be explaining why the Earth was warm to begin with. At the beginning of the Cenozoic, Africa and Eurasia were divided by an ocean. Also North and South America were far apart. 
This allowed for an ocean current almost over the equator, where warm could continuously warm up. Moreover, South America and Australia were still attached to Antarctica, forcing water from higher latitudes towards the equator, where they would warm. The Eocene was a warm period, with tropical forests covering Europe and mangroves rimming its edges. Yet, a cooling trend is already apparent in the Sahos curve. This does not reflect ice growth, but is related by these authors to a cooling of the deep ocean waters. Then, at the beginning of the Oligocene, around 34 million years ago, there's a sudden drop in temperature. This coincides with the opening of the Tasmanian Gateway, the connection between Antarctica and Australia. During the Oligocene, also the Drake Passage between South America and Antarctica is opened. Now we have an ocean current circling the southern continent at high latitudes, which is an important step towards a cooler Earth. Another marked drop in the Earth temperature is found at the beginning of the Quaternary, 2.4 million years ago. This coincides with the closure of the Panama Seaway, no longer allowing water from the Pacific to flow freely into the Atlantic. Now the currents of all oceans are directed to higher latitudes and we witness the beginning of the ice ages on the northern hemisphere. So can continental drift alone explain the major transitions in the Earth's climate? We skipped a major tectonic event in the Miocene, the closure of the seaway between Africa and Eurasia at about 18 million years ago. The formation of the so-called Homfotherium Bridge between the continents barred the through flow between the Atlantic and Indian Ocean. During the Miocene, we also see an important drop in the Sachos curve. However, this mid Miocene cooling occurs around 4 million years after the formation of the Homfotherium Bridge. It is not related directly to this tectonic event and instead correlated to the formation of glaciers on Antarctica. Plate tectonics set the scene for major trends in the Earth's climate. But our history of our climate is also determined by astronomic cycles, atmospheric currents, greenhouse gases, and feedbacks and thresholds. The configuration of the plates provided conditions for Canada to be covered by ice as recent as 15,000 years ago. But for the causes behind the glaciation, we need to look elsewhere. One thing is clear, the Earth changes perpetually, and so does its climate.